about it, you know, quiet students don't think about controlling that. They think about controlling it just maybe once in a while they worry about the bottom note, but rarely that they even see what's going on under here. Mm -hmm. Would you work on that in certain certain pieces demand that of you? Right. In particular? Or like well, polyphonic music, certainly. Mm -hmm. Anything polyphonic. Those Bach, correct. Bach, of correct. course. And then uh, and also uh, Schumann, for example, or, or Brahms, for example. Brahms has a lot of polyphonic. Mm -hmm. You have these little things coming in, and almost all of them actually composers from Beethoven, too. You just have to, to be able to, to see what's going on all, every note you play. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, at least, in my opinion, theoretically, you should be able to control every note you play. Every note has an ideal, which you don't always attain, or you probably never attain completely, but it has an ideal sound in the piece of music, in the context of the piece of music. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just looking at, at perfection, and uh, you never reach that. You have to have a goal or something. Then again, as I say, you know, Horowitz never played twice the same way, Rachmaninoff doesn't play twice the same way. Then, of course, things change, but you, you have to have that kind of flexibility, too, if you can. But, you know, when you work, you work towards some sort of goal. Even if the goal may change. Even if the goal may change. Uh, even if you, you, it's very, a very good idea, I feel, to be able to play the piece more than one way when mm -hmm. you're learning. To play phrases more than one way, maybe not the whole piece, maybe you can change the dynamics here and there. Always with, in light of what you, what's in the book, too. You know? mm -hmm. Not to go on automatic pilot, you kind of. You do have to keep the composer play. view too. Yeah. A little bit, you know, that yeah. you could go too far aboard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Depends on the composer too. But I either say if you're playing Beethoven's not, I you do look at what's in the book and get the best possible edition. Mm -hmm. uh, Horowitz always recommends the Henley edition at the time. I was very used to mm -hmm. second used to do that too. And uh, you look at it or text as much as possible and try to find out what was in the autograph, what was in the early edition. He, he would study the score? He would study the score a lot. He didn't always play everything according to the score. But he did study uh -huh. the score yeah. first of all, yeah. which I think is important. Yeah. He seems to be free, I mean very free. Very free. Oh, yeah. even more free than we usually hear today, you know. Any particular pieces, not that he was, not the ones that he was never satisfied with, but the ones that really worked out well with him, or that you remember as being especially, he was especially effective, I would assume I maybe well, Scriabin, I did, if yeah, you Yeah, know, I did remember. some Scriabin, one yeah. or two sonatas with him, fourth sonata, I think, fifth sonata, mm -hmm. yes, and we worked with that with him, mm -hmm. terribly different piece, and there's a uh, Professor Rachmaninoff third, I worked with him, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that must <laughs> That's really his territory. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the Paganini uh, Rhapsody. Uh, mm -hmm. well, I've been doing a lot of pieces with him. A few Beethoven sonatas as well, of Austin. Mm -hmm. and sonata. But very rarely modern stuff. Uh, anything. Well, he doesn't go into contemporary music. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it contemporary today. He used to play the Barber Sonata, which I haven't played. Well, it was fascinating to study with someone like that. Yeah, it's got to be. You, you've really had an experience that not many people. <laughs> <laughs> that's really true. You can get near him, let him know. Mm. Of course, you had to take things the way he wanted it. Uh, as far as lessons were concerned, uh, you'd always have to call him up and check to see whether he was able to teach that day or whether he was mm -hmm. being right. Then. Little under the weather, then of course you say call back next week or before I take a trip down from Montreal. Let's say that we have to know. Mm -hmm. But once I got there, he was always reliable. He'd always give me the lesson. You know, mm -hmm. he would leave me up in the air. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was a very nice person. Did you uh, talk about uh, non-musical things? I mean, literature. Uh, he, I guess he's sort of interested in he art. Is. And, uh, yes, he reads an awful lot. Especially in his later years, I think he read a lot. But he didn't talk very much about things outside of music. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally I socialize a little bit. His wife would be there, we'd have something to eat. And mm -hmm. I'd come down for a few days, you know, and probably have a lesson after or a lesson before. Or but he wouldn't really go into his personal life much, you know. And he wouldn't go into mine, which I like. You would know, talk about like who I was going out with or whatever, you know. Yeah. He wouldn't involve himself with that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Just concerned how I play. If I play well with the lessons, that's what I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. I had the impression uh, it took a real interest in your career. He did. And, and I you feel that he did take an interest in me at the time. In fact, uh, I think he was rather disappointed that my career didn't get bigger mm -hmm. than it did, but I think it's mostly my fault. <laughs> I don't think I can blame him one bit for that. I think I just didn't push it myself. I never pushed it. Is that the way you like it? I mean, well, yes. I, maybe I, that's more suitable. There was a, for yeah, there was a time. I'm a kind of, I get awfully nervous playing, and it takes a lot out of me. I found out that I, you know, doing this and traveling and just was not my cup of tea. I just mm -hmm. couldn't live that way. Mm -hmm. As I did some years, 60 concerts a year and stuff like that. And I said, am I going to do this the rest of my life? Yeah. And then I also wanted, later on, wanted to get to do some chamber music. I wanted to get into that. Mm -hmm. I'd had a small experience with it at Marlboro a couple of years back, way back in when I was around 18, 19, 20. And I wanted to really find out more about this field. I enjoy it as much as solo, maybe more. I had the opportunity to come up here long after that, you know, after my career had started to peter out and I didn't push it anymore. I said, well, I'm going to try to get into some chamber music. And sure enough, Stephen Starrick, who was oh, yeah. mm -hmm. in Chicago at one time, concert yeah, he master. Was principal second. Or he was concert master. He was concert master for a while. Yeah, in the 50s. He, yeah, way back. And uh, he called me and said, we're trying to form a piano quartet mm -hmm. in this country. And this was here in Canada. And he told me about these other string players that I didn't even know about, Gerald Stanek and uh, Tiyoshi Tsutsumi. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And uh, he's a marvelous challenge. Anyway, uh, so we got finally said, yeah, sure, I'd like to try that. It'd be fun. Had you been working out of Montreal? I'd been working out of Montreal at mm -hmm. the time. So what happened, that's how I got here. That's how I arrived here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is relevant to what you want to sure, sure, talk yeah. about, but... Uh, let me think what happened. Uh, we went to a summer camp, not this particular summer camp, but a rival summer camp actually on Vancouver Island, north of this one, north in the north part of Vancouver Island. And uh, which one was that? This is a Courtney Comox, Courtney Music Center. Uh, in the summers, it's not well known. Mm -hmm. This one's not well known. Anyway, uh, the the man in charge of that got us all there to play our first quartet recital, mm -hmm. and we did our sort of debut as a pro quartet there. We played uh, Brahms T minor, I think, and one of the Mozarts and Foray or something like that. We played on a couple, the three quartets in the recital out there. I remember the first time we ever played together. Mm -hmm. you, were, you knew that you'd be coming back here with... I didn't know at the time that I would be coming here, because mm -hmm. I didn't realize that mm -hmm. the head of this camp was also the applied chairman at Western here, oh, West, okay, Western Ontario. Okay. So through that, about a year or two later, I think it was quite a bit later, it was 77 when I started here, something like that. And I think I got out there in about 74, 75. And then we finally got all decided we were all going to come here mm -hmm. and do this thing as a quartet, to be residents here, mm -hmm. have some students, mm -hmm. play a little solo work, play little quartets and do whatever we else needed to do and that the quartet would be part of our workload here. Mm -hmm. Well that didn't work out too well for her long. It worked out for a while but uh, Stephen Starrick wanted to live in Toronto and, and the university didn't want him to commute from Toronto. He wanted to live here. It's about three hours? It's about two hours actually but uh, I don't know. Somehow he never yeah. came. He only came for rehearsals and you know a couple of lessons and take off. They didn't like that. Whatever happened uh, he finally he played a year or two that way with us and then and left the quartet. Mm -hmm. And uh, our violist, Gerald Stanek, moved here, of course, at the time and uh, stayed a year or two, didn't like it anymore, and decided mm -hmm. to move back out west where he comes from. Mm -hmm. So our quartet is now spread all over the place. <laughs> and now uh, Tsutsumi decided to move to Illinois. Mm -hmm. And our violinist, the one that replaced Starek, is uh, Yuri Mazakevich, a very fine violinist who was mm -hmm. teaching on the faculty here decided to go down the States as well, so mm -hmm. I'm the only one that's left here. <laughs> Our quartet is, is non-existent, really. I mean, we do play. We play in the summers every every summer here. Uh -huh. We just finished playing. That's right? Sean again. Uh, that's Sean again, which is now called GSA, but it's the same as Sean again. Uh -huh. used to be. And, uh, well, actually it moved from Sean again to Victoria. That's why they changed the name. 
And uh, anyway, we play there, and we play, we're going to play something in February, I understand, uh, out west. So Gerald Stonick is the, the guy who arranges things out there. He does Vancouver, some CBC work we do. Mm -hmm. And then I do some duos with Tsutsumi a lot, and I have been doing, uh, mm -hmm. we did one in Durham, North Carolina. Isn't he in Indiana now? He's in, uh, he's in Illinois. Illinois. Mm -hmm. He's in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, also our violinist is there, Mazakiewicz. It's kind of hard for us to get together now. You said Mr. Horowitz has made, thought maybe he should have a bigger career. Or, but it sounds like you, this is... Well, he did a lot of things. He tried. He got me into a Harold Shaw agency one time. I was with Columbia Artists mm -hmm. at first. I did a lot of community concert work. Right, Back that's in the days when, when this sort of thing was, yeah, they yeah. start you in there. So, yeah. The only trouble with that business is that uh, you don't develop an audience at all. Because oh. they're always promoting a new one every year. So you, you go to a town and then you never get back there because oh. they say next year, well, you had him, you can take this one and, and this is how it goes. So mm -hmm. rarely do you get back, except in exceptional cases you get back. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of hard to build an audience. It all depends so much on how the representatives from Columbia or other uh, community concert division promote you. So, mm -hmm. so, so a lot to the business. It's a lot, yeah, yeah. Uh, fortunately. But it sounds like this is kind of what you would uh, intended to do. It's a good experience, certainly. It's what I intended to do at the time, and I also was hoping to get more. Uh, that's way back now, big dates with orchestras, but th those are hard to get. Yeah. You know, unless you have direct connections in the right circles. And, uh, is that a matter of knowing the conductors usually? It helps. It helps to know those kind of people. And, and I think a good agent could help too, but good agents there are fierce. Mm -hmm. Most of them are so busy with so many people that they they just pick up a phone right now. Really, okay, you play there, X number of dollars, you play there, okay. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. Has that been kind of a deterior? You see that as a deterioration. So I business. feel that it's hard that that they will not promote very much. They promote only a very limited degree, mm -hmm. and uh, it's up to the pianist himself to do a lot of the mm -hmm. spade work, a lot of the uh, make the connections and try to sell himself to some extent. Is you think it's more more so that way than 30 years ago or 50 years ago? Probably more because uh, in the days, let's say, when the, when people like Horowitz and Rubinstein and Rachmaninoff and Hoffman, and I suppose the managers were, I don't know, the, the managers took more direct interest in the, in the man they were, they mm -hmm. were managing and I don't know if they had so many artists as they do today. Mm -hmm. So it was more personal attention then that we did it. Managers even used to travel with their with their pianists in the old days. Harwood usually had Shaw. Well he was one of the only one who could yeah. command that kind of thing, you know. Yeah, I can't imagine too many people. No, no. Today that's a supermarket kind of thing, you know. You just find that distracting or to, to have to Well first of all it must, it I must couldn't imagine ever playing hundred concerts a year being able to play really well, I don't know if I could do it. It takes a tremendous amount of stamina and mm -hmm. confidence in yourself and, and energy to, to be able to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it wasn't for me, that's all I know. But the key thing is not only to play 100 concerts, but to play them well. That's what I mean. Aren't, certainly there are pianists who play. There are pianists who play 100 concerts and have a good memory and then get by on that. And, and that's all, you know, they, they play fairly well, but then they, they don't play at top level. Mm -hmm. the, so the chamber music was it something that you had your eye on, maybe from your Mar Marlboro from days, from Marlboro days right. and you wanted to kind of... And it's, it's it, I feel a lot more comfortable in that kind of field, you know. Mm -hmm. There's not so much pressure as there is on the, on the soloist. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just a social. I mean, I mean yet with music is great. I mean, it's some of the greatest music I've ever written. Yeah. Some of the chamber pieces. What are you? What side of the repertoire in chamber music do you? Well, I think we've been doing mainly quartets, the piano quartets, and there are not an awful lot of those. There's the the three all Brahms. three Brahms and the two Mozart, and there's a Beethoven, and there's a Schumann, and there's a Fauré. There's two. One of them I have still to do. I hope we get it done this year. I like that piece, so which is right. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, then there's very few, you know, you go down to metal, some things are not so good, and uh, uh, let's see, what else do we play? I can't think of a lot of time, but we play a whole lot. 
We play uh, most of the ones that are known. Martin U is has a quartet. It's mm -hmm. quite good. Uh, but, uh, we'll play some Canadian things as well. There. What, uh, what, what Canadian composers? Well, we just did, uh, we did a Mary, Mary Adaskin one from uh, BC. How do you spell that name? Mary Adaskin. I did, also did a sonata with him, uh, uh, by him, with Timmy. A-D-A. S-K-I-N. Fantastic. And there's uh, another composer we did a quartet by was Tali Baldus Kennens. I don't know how you spell that. Uh, <laughs> I can spell, spell that out pretty good. T-A-L-I-V-A-L-D-I-S, I believe it is. Kennens is spelled K. T-A-L-I-V. Let me see if it looks right. That's all I know. That's all I got. It's Valdis. I'm going to write it for you. Valdis. Uh, it's Lithuanian or whatever. Latvian. Kennens. We did it. We did a quartet by him. It was kind of not bad. K E N I I N S. Yeah, I'd like to get that because I want to know what you're doing. That's you know Canadian. That's mm -hmm. specifically Canadian. We did that only once or twice a few years back. I think four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah, we did. But we, you know, we have to have some Canadian content every once in a while. And uh, what else did we play? We played a lot of stuff. Obviously, the three Brahms, two four, uh, one four A, one Beethoven, two Mozart. Uh, Schumann, um, Schumann E flat quartet. Schumann E flat quartet, not the quintet quartet. Quartet. It's less known than the quintet. And then there's the uh, Martinu. Uh, oh, Dvorak. We did two Dvorak's. Now some of these may not have been done with our latest violin. Or some of them were done with only with Steve Star. Although our latest uh, Yuri Masakevich has caught up pretty much on. Mm -hmm. the what is it about chamber music that? Gets to you especially. I mean, it's, a, it's not solo. It's not. It's not solo. solo it's, it's not. Uh, it's not orchestral. It's uh, working with in close proximity with string players or wind players or whatever. I find it's uh, you get to hear the sounds of the, that they produce and to learn more about sound and music in general. I find it rubs off how they phrase it, how a bowing is done, how it. You get so close to hearing this kind of music and how they, they, they operate with these instruments that it rubs off on the piano. Mm -hmm. and after all, we're trying to imitate uh, singing tone most of the time anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. a voice, human voice, or, or it's string instruments, and then we have a percussive instrument to do it mm -hmm. with. So just to imitate, uh, let's say, Brahms C minor quartet, the uh, theme, you know, in, in this little movement there, it's so wonderful. And, uh, all the Brahms quartets, for example. And once in a while, the theme will come in the piano part. I find it very, I learned so much doing that. One thing you learn about playing quartets is, is good pacing, good rhythm. Mm -hmm. You can't get away with rushing, you can't get away with anything that's. Mm -hmm. They'll complain right away. They'll say, uh uh. <laughs> 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 if anybody rushes in there, <laughs> they know about it. You know just how much you can go, how far you can go away from a you know, mathematically straight tempo. And mm -hmm. It's a great learning experience, I find. I wish more of my students could really get into it. But they don't have time? They don't have time. It's just a trouble with teaching at a university where I am. They have so much else to do. Yeah. And piano is only one course. Yeah. Yeah, I know. In my music school, we always had to. You, yeah, you yeah. studied in Indiana, didn't you? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. Not the same, I guess. It must be even tougher. Yeah, we'd have to go. To, you see, we'd have to go to choir every afternoon, right. middle of the afternoon. That kind of wrecked your whole, cut your practice time in half. Exactly. There were lots of academic courses. That were, they weren't even that. If they'd been better taught, I would have maybe. Well, it's just hard to do all that in such a short time, and then you're required to do examinations at the end of the year, and. You have to have a recital program ready, you know, to graduate, and mm -hmm. at the same time you've got to do all this other stuff. So naturally, your your program suffers. Yeah. You don't get through anything more than what you have to play on the recital, but if you don't dare, yeah. you won't be having it ready. Yeah. <laughs> Piece of shape. How about your teaching? That was something else that you got into at the same that time. That was a, I'm here I'm a relative new neophyte. I think I've only been teaching for seven years, uh, mm -hmm. about eight years now. Uh, so I don't. Were you concertizing soul? Is that your I was and just and my bread and butter was concertizing at one time, and I could make a living on that for a while. And uh, then I got in here. I've got a sort of what do you call a steady job, I guess. 
tenure and everything else. Respectable job, yeah. Respectable and uh, do a little bit of uh, playing, chamber music. Of course, mm -hmm. I also play with people at school, uh, like we all do. You know, I play with wind players mm -hmm. and singers and whatever happens to come up. Uh, I enjoy that as well. So I'm kept busy here. I don't really, I'm not as busy as I would doing 100 concerts a year, but I'm still mm -hmm. also busy. This is something that I wanted, one thread I wanted to pick up on. You mentioned pianists are always imitating another instrument or a voice. Quite often. Was the, did your mother sort of introduce that idea to you, I mean, as a singer? I don't think really, no, because she didn't teach me to any great extent. She taught me when I was three years old, and then we also went, or four or whatever it was when I started, I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. I was going to three, going on four or something like that. She taught me for a few, the first few Mm -hmm. maybe, and then I went to a teacher right away. Mm -hmm. She took me to a teacher. So mm -hmm. she didn't do very much in the way of teaching. She didn't feel that she should kind of teach me. But she always would be a very difficult critic for me. She, maybe mm -hmm. she would listen to my play. No, no, that's that doesn't sound right. She would always <laughs> have her ideas. So. Yeah, in those days. So but she was hard to practice for. I didn't ever like to practice when she was around because uh, she knew a lot of things that she was talking about too, by instinct. So you've been at that seven years. I feel like teaching is one of the best learning experiences. That in chamber music. For you. For yeah. me. For me as well. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of teachers will agree. That you pick up a lot from just the act of teaching and thinking about that much more about the piece because you have to teach it. Mm -hmm. Listening to somebody do it maybe poorly. I mean, what can be done to improve? I'm deducing that you have a lot of natural talent, especially if you can get it through to Curtis without the kind of... I never studied at Curtis, no. Oh, but I studied to private. To Big okay. Gareva, yes, right. Without maybe sort of having transcended your teaching in Montreal, which you think maybe wasn't... Right, right. Quite he wasn't quite up to it. No, so but... Do you find now when you go back that you never knew exactly how you did something, or you never knew exactly why, and then you have to explain it? In those days, I didn't. Sometimes. A lot of things I didn't know why I did it. Mm -hmm. I did it because somebody told me, some teacher told me sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's the way you learn things as a kid, somehow. unless it's explained properly and why it's done. Uh, it takes a while to learn to play the piano. Very instrument, I suppose. Okay, we'll quote you on that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you find when students come to you? What's the biggest, what are the biggest troubles? Mm -hmm. I suppose technical. Technical problems. Small hands, mm -hmm. things like that are really basic problems that are very hard to overcome. Uh, you can do the best you can. You can try to get them to play with proper mechanical principles, good hand position. Uh, you know, generally getting around the keyboard in the most economical way. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's when you move, I was taught it's very to fast, horizontal very fast, horizontal. And that's motion. how Horowitz is, isn't yes, it? Yes, pretty much. You never, you never see Horowitz go looping around very often. You know, mm -hmm. you know, so you, 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 you also. I teach that way. Yeah. Yes, I teach, mm -hmm. I teach mostly a combination of Horowitz and less than Gerber than more Horowitz, I would say. Mm -hmm. And Gara had a very special way of teaching her. You probably heard about her, the up and oh, down something of, yeah. up and down wrist. Which I agree with to a point, you know, that has very good ideas with, behind that. Psychologically, it gives you the feeling of curvature of phrases. And that was Psychological, behind that. Psychologically. Yeah. Mechanically, partly, I still use a lot of that. Uh, but she, she wanted me to use it so much that I felt that I lost strength in the, in the fingers doing that, like the way I was doing it. So mm -hmm. Horowitz said, no, 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 no. You play like that. <laughs> Straight. Very quick. Push. But there's nothing... And relaxing too. Yeah, that, that must... It looks a little stiff when you're talking it, but there's nothing... But I don't I don't play melodies like that. You know, no. I, I play... Mm -hmm. But the main thing I find, and one of the most important things to control the tone, is to stop pushing that finger down after you reach the bottom. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot of that from, from August Camillo. Mm -hmm. Kind of hard, so not to not to squeeze the keyboard. So well, once you learn that, then you probably have. Well, once it's, it's done. Once it's done, there's not more you can do. So what's happening? You push in a little longer here. Your energy's going in. It's taking away from whatever control you're going to have here. Mm -hmm. You should be prepared, focused. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. In advance. You're, are you, you're almost, I'm always having the feeling you're preparing somehow each Preparing each note. I was about to do that. By August Drummond. It's the middle of mm -hmm. the It's basically the Megara system that you that. You're preparing each one of the four Again, not, a, not too much of this. That applies to certain techniques, certain types of work. The high, the high. The high I like practicing with high fingers just to loosen this up. I find this is very useful, mm -hmm. but not necessarily to play, because mm -hmm. it's tiring, first of all. Were there any exercises that any of those teachers in particular gave you, purely technical exercises? Well, Horowitz didn't give exercises to speak of. He gave one or two exercises just like that. He, you'd have to play. It's a, probably a fairly well-known exercise. I'm sure others have given it. It's just you play one note forte on the other's piano. And first mm -hmm. of all, it could be little finger. The fourth finger is the most difficult one. Mm -hmm. Everything else piano, and supposedly together. Mm -hmm. Very difficult exercise to do right, uh, mm -hmm. but it's certainly good for you. Easy to explain. Easy to explain. <laughs> you have to keep the good hand position. It gives mm -hmm. you that voicing control that mm -hmm. you need. That's what you thought was important. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of, of exercise you need for that, for voicing. So certainly in your own students, that's a shortcoming that you almost always have to work with, I would assume, well, at least when they first Technically, come Technically, yes, I do have to work with uh, control of tone, uh, stiffness, trying to get get out of this kind of business, you know, mm -hmm. and then, you know, yeah. all to... How do you do that? I mean, it's hard. It's hard to get it out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go right away. It's something that mm -hmm. one works at. We have to undo sometimes years of of bad teaching mm -hmm. and, and, and not elbows out and things like this that you may come across. And, and already they're eight, 17, and already they're, they come, you know, 17, 18, 19. Mm -hmm. and it's difficult to correct at that time. Mm -hmm. They only got four years to do it. So what they, what I hope to gain here is that teach them as much as possible for the future, for what they can do after they get out of here, after out of university, when they don't have all those studies mm -hmm. to do when they can practice four or five hours a day at least, uh, then maybe they can, if they know the right principles of playing, if they can really get into the system in the four years they're here, right, playing, interpretation, all the various things that are involved, then hopefully they can go on. Mm -hmm. And then I expect them to go on to other teachers as well. You, know, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, you can't learn everything from one teacher. You've had three, uh, had three that you, you really... I've had three that I really consider the most influential, and I've had about four or five others uh, before yeah. that. Let me get back to Vengerova a little bit. That's that's another titanic name uh, right. in, in piano playing. She's Russian, as was Horowitz, but you said they were very different. Very different, technically. She, appa she apparently screamed a lot, as at least oh, she was a lot of from what I read. I <laughs> <laughs> she could be difficult. Yeah. Did you read <laughs> Gary Grafman's book? Uh, I haven't read it completely, no, but uh, yeah. I, he does talk about that, right? He writes about it in a humorous, kind of a humorous way. It's oh, yeah. I think it's charming the way he. he uh, I enjoy the book a lot. Right, right. He uh, that describes time. how she would. He did something against her ideas, and he would do it sometimes. In, and he described once doing it in a concert, 